Welcome to Congenital Heart Academy. We are very happy today is a special day. Me and Sasha, we are together in a mission trip. And uh, so we are happy to be after two years of Congenital Heart Academy to present something together. And uh, please follow us on social media and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can see what we are planning for the next uh, a couple of weeks. And today you're going to have an amazing session with Dr. Silverman. And uh, this is going to be great. Norman, with you. Thank you, guys. And please type your questions on Thank the Q&A chat box. In the end, uh, uh, Dr. Silverman is going to answer all of your questions. Okay. Well, um, so now I have to share my screen. And we share yes. this. Here we go. Good morning. I uh, welcome again to the Congenital Heart Academy. I'm very happy to... Uh, see Sasha and Grace together. I never thought I would see that, but they're together. And um, we're going to discuss this morning uh, hearts with isomerism, which was formerly called heterotaxy. Um, all, all of this information is contained in a textbook that I've written called www.md1world.com. You can also review today's lecture which will be available on the Congenital Heart Academy website. And if you have any better pictures of information for me, you can always get hold of me by writing to me at norm underscore silverman at mac.com. So today we're going to look at the 15th chapter of uh, this uh, work uh, in some detail. And um, I don't know what's going on here now. So, uh, oh dear. Yes, Norman, you have to put on slide presentation. I you, wasn't... Open a lot, you open a lot of pages. Yes, I know, oh. but I had the slide presentation and now it's disappeared. Now, yes. Is... Start again, don't worry. All right, there we go. Okay. Uh, yes. Share, you are sharing your screen. Okay. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so thank you. We're defining isomerism, which previously was called heterotaxy. Uh, and the word uh, heterotaxy is derived from Greek, with, which uh, heteros means other and taxis means uh, arrangement. And heterotaxy literally means a pattern of anatomical organization of the thoracic and abdominal organs, which is not the expected usual or normal arrangement. Heterotaxy is defined as an abnormality where the internal thoracoabdominal organs demonstrate abnormal arrangement across the left-right axis of the body. We include mirror imagery, formerly called situs inversus, as part of this definition. The word isomerism is derived from Greek, iso meaning equal and meros equal meaning parts. Isomerism refers to structures that in themselves are mirror image. When used in the connection with congenitally malformed hearts, the term isomerism has become the conventional description for the situation in which morphologically right structures or morphologically left structures are found on both sides of the body in the same individual. This divides patients into two subsets, those with isomerism of the left atrial appendages and bronchi, and those with isomerism of the right atrial appendages and bronchi. Sequential segmental analysis requires complete description of both the cardiac relations and junctional connections of the cardiac se section segments. One must document the arrangements of the venoatrial atrial connections, atrial appendages and arrangement ventricular topology, the nature of the unions of the segments across the atrioventricular and ventricular arterial junctions, and the morphology of the infundibular septum and the great vessels in space. So we define isomerism as the essential features of the atrial appendages. That is, the essential feature of the atrial appendages are the pectinate muscles of the atrial appendages. But the pattern occurs in many paired body organs, including bronchial branching, 
lung lobations, the hands and the feet. The left hand is a mirror image of the right hand and the left foot, a mirror image of the right foot and so on. So lateral paired body organs are isomers of each other. Unpaired organs such as the abdominal viscera have specific anatomic patterns such as the liver, spleen, gallbladder and genital urinary system. And I'll bring this to your attention too. So this is a whole issue. Now, there's a genetic basis to this because many genetic systems have uh, abnormality of body organ position. Primary ciliary dyskinesia and all of the associations of other genetic syndromes express isomerism. And there are many of these. For the most part, the segregation is pure and harmonious. But segregation is, a, segregation is occasionally disharmonious with elements such as the absent spleen or bilateral right bronchia associated with left isomerism and multiple spleens with right-sided atrial appendages and bilateral bronchi with right isomerism. Within the heart, there's this considerable crossover with some cardiac anomalies pointing to one or other type of arrangement. And for example, complete heart block, inferior vena caval obstruction with azagous continuation, excessive trabeculation occurs with left isomerism, whereas absence of the coronary sinus, obstructed totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection and pulmonary atresia with transposition in right isomerism. The two forms of isomerism have clusters of abnormalities that overlap such as the atrioventricular septal defect and many others. So this, we need to underscore that uh, we need to look at all of the segments of the heart to define these abnormalities. Now, where does this all start? And I think that there's a strong in indication that these are, uh, in fact, um, genetic syndromes. And this is a picture at the bottom of uh, from uh, Professor Anderson's latest volume on pediatric cardiology, showing this uh, issue around the end of gastrulation, the mobile cilia around the rostral end of the primitive streak, here's the primitive streak, establish a flow of extracellular fluid across the nose from right to left. So right is this way, to left is that way. Right to left establishes a flow of fluid. Okay. Stimulating receptor cells at the node to initiate a transcription cascade. Uh, that's a genetic uh, thing that instructs the lateral plate to generate left-sided structures. Okay. Right-sided structures seem to develop by default. This fundamental process is remarkably complex with multi-element effector and receptor cells mediated by complex genetic mechanisms leading to essential change or gene products determining sidedness on either side. And in fact, for the whole body. And if you want to read the references, here is a reference from Dr. Hirokawa et al in Current Opinions in Cell Biology, and also a paper uh, introducing a paper from Canada by Dr. Um, Stephen Sanders and Tal Gaeva on classifying heterotaxy syndromes. Now I've mentioned these cilia. So let's just have a look at some cilia. This is courtesy of Mary D'Onofrio and Linda Leatherbury, uh, who were looking at patients with primary ciliary dyskinesia. So on the left is a normal nasal scraped cell. And you can see that the cell lying in a, a saline media has, uh, when it lives, a marked cilial motion. So cilial motion is part of the respiratory gastrointestinal tract. And you see here that it's setting up a wave of motion. It's moving uh, in this direction. And that's very important because this is a patient here where you'll see these little cilia are moving. 
And this is a patient with primary ciliary dyskinesia, used to be called Cartagenous syndrome or Cartagena syndrome for my Hispanic friends. And this uh, syndrome is associated with situs inversus, many uh, examples of uh, uh, heterotaxy, uh, and um, have um, uh, uh, sinobronchitis, bronchiectasis, infertility, all the things that cilial motion is important to define. And you can see that these things are actually moving, but compare the quality of the movement, movement here. And this is an example of something that set up abnormalities of the uh, atrial arrangement. Now, our clinical approach is that we start off with this in fetal life, and I'm going to use some examples of fetal cardiology in this to show the viscera of the body uh, and uh, the ultrasound examination, particularly with isomerism, the examiner must establish all the connections, as I've mentioned before. And this presentation will describe the features of normal position and symmetry of the body organs, the extracardiac features that involve in fetal life, such as lung lobation, bowel, liver, gallbladder, splenic abnormalities, which suggest isomerism. And we will display the primary features of the atrial appendage isomerism related to the morphological findings in this abnormality. Associated abnormalities will point the clinician towards the diagnosis of, their, of isomerism will then be displayed. And because these abnormalities occur in clusters, they raise the possibility that isomerism is present. This is the clinical key right here. And because the clinician can uh, use clustering to decide if it's isomerism is more likely to be right or left and then refocus his examination towards the primary features in the atriums. And here is a really old picture for you to describe particularly for those uh, novices in the, our group here today, that um, there um, is normal with a right lung with three lobes, a left lung with two lobes, right bronchus, which is short with an epiterial bronchus, left lung bronchus, which is long, and it doesn't have an epiterial lobe. The essential feature is the atrial appendages. And here we're looking at the morphology of the atrial appendages. This is not absolutely a sine qua non of the diagnosis because you can have appendages that because of uh, uh, hemodynamic features may be entirely different. And so this may look externally like a left atrial appendage and this internally, externally, like a right atrial appendage. But when you go internally and you look at the pectinate muscles, then you can get the key as to which is the right and left atrial appendage. And that's a very, very important point. And then, of course, the liver is on the, the left, the right, the stomach is on the left, the spleen is on the left, and the bowel is in normal arrangement with the appendix on the right iliac fossa, the colon running over here, and the sigmoid in the left iliac fossa, and the uh, jejunum here, and the ileum here towards the right. So a specific pattern, very important. The mirror image of this, what used to be called situs inversus, which we now call mirror imagery, which is it, what it is. It's not upside down, which would be inverse. So this is why we call it mirror imagery, is exactly the mirror image of this arrangement. And our two omer, uh, options for right and left isomerism are as follows. In right isomerism, there are three uh, lobes to both lungs, two bilateral right bronchi, two right atrial appendages, a central liver, and usually no spleen, together with bowel malrotation. In left isomerism, the, uh, there are two left bronchi and only a, a major fissure, two left atrial appendages morphologically and also by pectinate musculature, a central liver, not as central as in this condition, and a condition that used to be called 
polysplenia, which is a bad term. And I'll explain why I don't like that term to you so that you can understand why we don't use polysplenia. And I think generally the world is describing polysplenia as an inappropriate term. And this is left isomerism. And what often happens here is that the gallbladder is absent and there's uh, in a small percentage of cases, extra hepatic biliary atresia and the absent gallbladder is the herald of this condition. So now let's just look morphologically at uh, a heart. I'm sorry for the color differences. I thought I would correct it, but uh, this is native in the same patient with different light photographed here showing the right lung being right-sided and the left lung also a, by a, a right lobe by its lobation. And on the left in left isomerism, here is only one major fissure on each lung over here, uh, indicating that the lungs are bilaterally left. Now, when we go to clinical and pathological uh, structures of the crop, you'll see in both of these examples in isomerism, both right and left, that the heart can be on the inappropriate side. The stomach liver anatomy is distorted in both of these. There are bilateral right lungs. I'll try and show this a little better. That may not come out on the, um, the, um, the quality of the x-ray, may not transmit on Zoom. Uh, and here we see uh, two um, minor fissures on either side and the apex on this side here. And notice the bowel is totally disordered in its rotation, okay? And this occurs in both right and left isomerism. Here, the liver is uh, more bilobed. The heart still has dextrocardia. And the lung fields are more um, prominent here due to the fact that there is frequently in the left isomerism more than right, a left to right shunting. Um, I've zoomed those up for the benefit of people looking at this on their iPhones, uh, like our, uh, uh, our host this morning, because uh, it may be a little small when looking on the screen. So now we talked about the bronchial arrangement in right and left isomerism. And here are two beautiful dissections from Professor Robert Anderson, which shows classical bilateral bronchi on either side of this uh, dissection. Uh, and so this is bilateral right bronchi, more commonly and easier to see uh, indicators of uh, the type of isomerism. And in addition, here is an example of infradiaphragmatic total anomalous pulmonary venous return in this example. Now we can see this by CT scan, we can see it by MRI, we can diagnose this in the fetus. This is postnatal example. Here is left isomerism. Note the absence of the epitherial bronchi bilaterally. Symmetrical relationship is the feature. And here are the pulmonary veins, one pulmonary vein to the uh, right left-sided atrium and one pulmonary vein to the right-sided atrium because we're looking at these from the back. And here is a CT scan again once again, showing that um, we can actually start looking at the uh, symmetry of the bronchi from uh, even something as simple as a chest x-ray. So here we are looking at a much more sophisticated thing, courtesy of Dr. Shumpei Mori from UCLA, who's showing us bilateral symmetrical right bronchi and bilaterally symmetrical pulmonary arteries, okay? And each of these pulmonary arteries has got an, ep, uh, an upper lobe artery as well, but that the main artery is lying below the bronchus. So in right isomerism, the bronchuses are ep arterial above the arteries. 
And I have this example to show that you can actually see this in the fetus. This example is from my friend, Dr. C.R. Patel from Akron Children's Hospital. And he sent me these beautiful pictures showing me an example of right isomerism. And here you can see the symmetrical uh, palmary arteries. Okay. And you can actually see bronchi below this over here. But uh, we are looking here at the palmary trunk, the superior cable vein, the right and left palmary arteries, and so on and so forth, and the vertical vein, just as we saw before, and descending aorta here. And when we look at the heart in color, you can see as we put on the color with a low frequency, we can see the flow in the palmary arteries, but we can also see the flow in the tracheobronchial tree. And here is the right bronchus that you can see here. And you can see that this is bronchus and there's a left bronchus on this side, right over there. And these bronchuses are below the pulmonary arteries. I beg your pardon, are above, I'm so sorry, above the pulmonary arteries. So these are epiterial bronchuses and you have to go out laterally, not medially, to see these vessels crossing over the bronchi. So you can see that the breathing rate in this fetus here, and you have to have breathing in order to do this, moving the uh, tracheobronchial and amniotic fluid in and out uh, as the fetus is breathing. And you can see the rate of the breathing is somewhat different to the heart rate. So I think that this is something that's very valuable in terms of making an examination in the human fetus to recognize isomerism. Now in bilateral left bronchi, we can see here that the bronchi laterally run below the palmary arteries. And although I've labeled them as right and left palmary arteries, just for the sake of the side in this, the bronchi have symmetry to them. And here is another picture from Siot Patel again, showing the bronchi running clearly below the pulmonary arterial structures. Unfortunately, I do not have a color flow picture for this, but I think that the bronchi are clearly running below the pulmonary arteries. Yeah. Now we look at the atrial appendages and we look at the outside of the appendages and the inside. I've highlighted the uh, appendage morphology in red and the body or the connection to the, uh, to the uh, other part of the atrium in yellow. And I've had dissections of these inside showing the coronary sinus, the position of the oval fossa and the right atrial appendage, which is broad and triangular and has this characteristic trabecular pattern of the uh, atrial appendages, which is so easy to recognize morphologically. And this is the fundamental of recognizing the right atrial appendage. And even through the uh, appendage, when it's closed, you can see the pectinate muscles coming out of the appendage and surrounding the vestibule of the tricuspid valve. Now the left atrial appendage, this is called an upside down map of India. And I call this the map of Norway because there are lots of little fjords going inside and outside on these appendages, which we can recognize. It has a very narrow attachment to the body of the atrium. Here are the palmary veins. This is seen from the back. And you can see little pectinate muscles, but you can't compare the quality of these pectinate muscles through there. And when you look inside, you see this tiny little uh, pectinate muscle here and the attachment to the rest of the body of the atrium with the pulmonary veins on each side. So I'll take these uh, pictures off for you so that you can look at this in real time and here compare the normal pattern of a right atrial appendage to the normal pattern of a left atrial appendage. 
and we can open the heart and look at down on the atrial on the on on the atrioventricular valve and you can see here the appendage pectinate musculature coming out and surrounding the vestibule of the tricuspid valve and these are prominent appendages here we look at the left atrial appendages you can see these tiny little pectinate muscles okay and here is the entrance into the left atrium which is one of the reasons why thrombi in atrial fibrillation are a problem because there is not a lot of good flow over this narrow orifice here. And then here is the uh, fact that we're looking at the vestibule of the valve and you can see that there are no pectinate muscles here. Here is the horseshoe shape of septum primum on the left side of the atrium. Now, morphologically, we can look at this in genetic influences. On the left is a Pitex 2 mouse knockout. And Pitex 2 defines uh, left atrial isomerism. And here we have an example of knocking out the gene for making left sidedness. And as we said, genetically becomes by default right atrial appendages. And what I want to show you is not only can we see these pectinate muscles, but we can see something that we can recognize echocardiographically, even in the fetus. The fact that we can see pectinate, uh, uh, um, the, um, uh, the terminal crests or crista terminalis on both sides indicates that they are bilateral right atrial appendages. And here is a patient with a lefty knockout mouse uh, uh, done histologically and lefty uh, will um, um, cause the, the, uh, the um, appendages to develop and the whole body to develop left, double left sidedness. And here you can see tiny little left atrial appendages with teeny weeny uh, pectinate muscles in them uh, and a, an AV septal defect, which is right dominant. So look at the difference of the pectinate muscles in right and left isomerism even embryologically uh, possible to develop. So we have these four options, which I've sort of shown you, situs solitus, situs inversus, double right-sided structures with prominent pectinate muscles. And this terminal crest is a pectinate muscle and is easy to see. Uh, I didn't talk about the AV node, the SA node here, Here's the SA node here on both sides. So because this is a right atrium and this is the right atrium, there are usually two sinus nodes. One is electronically suppressed by the other, but histologically, there are often two sinoatrial nodes. And in left isomerism, because the uh, sinus node is a right structure, there are usually no left-sided, uh, there's no uh, sinus node in either atrium because they both morphologically left atriums, uh, and they have low atrial pacemakers, which gives rise to the characteristic coronary sinus rhythm on ECG. Now, in addition to this, here is a histology of a, a, a fetus, a, a big pardon, a patient with right isomerism showing bilateral sinus nodes in the presence of an AV septal defect. So this is uh, probably a right atrial appendages. We don't normally uh, get to see this histology in the diagnosis. And here are the two options that you have with isomic atrial appendages. Although they usually have a single inlet, this has been depicted here as showing a what we call right-handed topology or what some people might call a D-loop pattern. And this is the left-handed pattern with the so-called L-loop for isomeric right atrial appendages. And the same is true for isomeric left atrial appendages. You may have right or left-handed topology. And in the condition where there's left-handed topology, there's frequently what they call the Monkeyberg spleen sling, S-L-I-N-G. 
And this is a condition where there is a junction between two AV nodes across the appendages, giving rise to excitement that it can occur uh, from either appendage and gives a beautiful ECG pattern. Now, when we look at the appendage morphology, we're going to look now at the left-sided morphology. So here are two left atrial appendages. This one's prominent, more prominent, but it does not surround the vestibule of the valve at all. Here's the inferior cable vein, an AV septal defect, and bilateral morphologically looking appendages with uh, pectinate muscles to match. And here is another picture from my own archive showing a patient that had this condition. And you can see that the appendages uh, do have a very similar appearance. They are narrowly attached to the body of the atriums. There is also um, a, a, an antero-posterior relationship of the aorta, suggesting double uh, outlet ventricle. And the apex of the heart is pointing to the right. And here is an echocardiographic example, which shows all of the features of, these, of the uh, pattern. And you can see here the, um, the spine, the azygous vein, the descending aorta, a solitary strand of atrial tissue, a good pointer to the presence of isomerism, but not perfect, bilateral left atrial appendages, no pectinate muscles, a complete AV septal defect, complete heart block, as you'll see when it moves, and spongy myocardium. So here are all of these things in real time. Here's the spine over here, the azygous vein behind the aorta. So the IVC is interrupted in this condition here. And you can see that these appendages have a narrow base attachment and are finger-like in their uh, attachment, suggesting the presence of left isomerism. And I think that this heart certainly had that appearance, together with the fact that if you look at atrial contraction here, it's working at almost twice the rate of the ventricle here, which is another feature of left isomerism, the presence of heart block. So there you go, fundamental features. Here is right isomerism appendages. And you see here the septal primum reflected up. So there's a big uh, AV canal defect. Here's a complete canal with an, uh, an, an anterosuperior leaflet, which is not attached to the ventricular septum. The mural, the posterior bridging leaflet is here. If you look at the appendages bilaterally dissected, these appendages have big, heavy trabeculated pectinate muscles which surround the vestibule of the valve. And as I pointed out to you, have the pectinate muscles prominently displayed in both atriums, which have right atrial appendage morphology. And here is an example in a fetus of uh, right isomerism. So the appendages have pretty much similar appearance. They are fairly broad based. There are terminal crests bilaterally. I'll let you move on this. This is the right side of the fetus. This is the left side of the fetus. There is an absent connection of this side, which is one of the features of right isomerism. There's the morphologically right and morphologically left ventricle. Here's the solitary AV valve. And here are the pulmonary veins that you can see. What you can't see in the still frame is the atrial septum is here. So the pulmonary veins are draining to the wrong atrium. They're draining to the right atrium. So there's totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection to the right atrium. And there you see it in real time. Look at the uh, terminal crests here, even in the fetus. Okay. And here you can see the pulmonary veins draining to the right sided atrium, an absent connection here. 
a normal valve on this side. Terminal crests, once again, septum, terminal crest, terminal crest. And here we do this again on the right. Both of these pictures have been seen. Here's the terminal crest bilaterally, the pectinate muscles, uh, the um, knockout mouse that I showed you earlier. And here from my colleague, Bill Border in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, an example of beautiful bilateral terminal crests or crested terminalis on each side. And both of these are morphologically right atriums. The palmy arteries have symmetry here. We don't know what the bronchial anatomy was, but the point about this is how easy it is to see large terminal crests. And probably we haven't paid enough attention to this in the, the direction, in the definition of isomerism echocardiographically and something that I think is vitally important and essential to look at. So the terminal crests are our echocardiographic hallmark to the pectinate muscles, which as you can see, even in a neonate are difficult to, to define echocardiographically. So now let's look at the common extracardiac manifestations of isomerism. Okay, so these also help you with the direction. Now, the first one, of course, is the old fashioned polysplenia. Now, polysplenia is not just multiple spleens. The, the embryological development of these is that the spleens develop in the lienorenal ligament here, and they usually develop on the outside of the lienorenal ligament, which is part of the lesser sac the dorsal mesentery of the cabal, and they develop on the one side, on the outside. But here you can see that there are nine spleens already developed, but they develop on both sides of the spine, of, 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 the, of the, the, the central ligament. So uh, there's really confusion in terms of the development. <coughs> and here are two CT scans showing these multiple spleens here are beautiful spleens with some contrast material in the stomach from my archive. So what is the splenic status tell us about isomerism? Well, let's look in right isomerism first. And here is the absent spleen, 55% of patients here. And here are patients with the solitary spleen. I mean, this is absence spleen. So, so, so it's true that in, uh, in uh, right isomerism, you won't see a spleen, but sometimes you do. And sometimes there are even multiple spleens. And this is called segmental disharmony and was brought to, to light by Professor Anderson and the people from Toronto, uh, Lars Gross of Ortman's group uh, and Sidhu News group about the fact that sometimes the uh, spleen doesn't tell you what's going on with the, uh, 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 with the atrial appendage morphology. So, and of course, 27% of the autopsy records could not show this. When it comes to multiple spleens, polysplenia was present in 64 patients near, of nearly uh, 85. The, the numbers are, are, are over here. Three of them had absent spleen. So although the condition was called polysplenia, three of them had an absent spleen. And seven had a solitary spleen. So the message is a segmental disharmony here in a, a really a substantial number of patients. So using the spleen is not a way of doing things. <coughs> now, as far as the bowel is concerned, People tend to display it. Here's dextrocardia, bilateral livers, courtesy of Sijun Yu, my friend from Toronto. <clears throat> and as we look here at this heart here, uh, at, the, at the bowel here, <clears throat> you can see the small bowel and the colon are all disordered in their arrangement. And remember, the uh, bowel develops as a solitary loop. The loop uh, herniates through at six weeks into the salomic cavity, and there it develops and grows. And at 12 weeks, 
in an ordered fashion, it comes back into the body. And so the pattern of order is disordered in this condition. So this is from the front. Here you can see a partial stomach in uh, going into the uh, chest, and you can see that there are bilateral uh, uh, trilobe lungs on both sides, as well as some enlargement of the kidneys. <clears throat> so I would like to use these lists. I published it in my textbook in 1991. But overall, right isomerism has uh, these findings in almost 100%. It's less common in uh, uh, left isomerism, 80% of patients. So there are patients that are relatively normal that have <clears throat> features, for example, um, may have uh, a, an absent gallbladder, extra fatty filaria atresia, interrupted IBC, or Stella van Praag told me, may even have only a left superior vein in the cava to coronary sinus. So bilateral superior cavies occur in 45% of time. The difference is that in right isomerism, they go to the roof. In the left isomerism, because there's a coronary sinus, one drains into a coronary sinus, which usually has a coronary sinus septal defect. The coronary sinus is absent in approximately 100% of patients. I've never seen an example of a coronary sinus in right isomerism. In 60% of patients, the coronary sinus is uh, defective because of the uh, SVC. Uh, interruption of the IVC again highlights the left isomerism. Juxtaposition of the IVC and aorta on the same side of the spine highlights right isomerism. Extra cardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return in 50%, according to Dr. Yu Yun, I would think that it would be even higher than this and is rare in left isomerism. AV septal defects is the norm in this condition, but also present here and may not even have a, 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 an, an AV septal defect, but they have just a ventricular septal defect. <clears throat> the AV connection is usually univentricular in right isomerism, but biventricular left, although you see that there is a crossover here. The VA connection is un concordant in only 5% of these patients. In other words, there is either transposition or there may be double outlet right ventricle, but it is concordant in 70% of patients with left isomerism. Pulmonary atresia and stenosis, when you see this, you usually think of right isomerism, but it does occur in left isomerism. Left-sided obstructed regions are rare in right isomerism, but commoner in left isomerism. And excessive trabeculation is otherwise called spongy myocardium or uh, hypertrabeculation <clears throat> is not seen in left right isomerism, but occurs in a proportion of right isomerism. And arrhythmias, SVT in 25% of right isomerism, complete heart block in 13 or 70% of left isomerism. So when you see heart block, think left isomerism. Intestinal malrotation to a greater or a lesser degree occurs in almost all patients. Partial stomach in right isomerism, biliary atresia in left isomerism, in almost one out of five, I, this is higher than my own uh, series shows. <clears throat> Duodenal atresia also occurs, and urogenital anomalies such as a bifid uterus or absent uterus occurs in left isomerism. And I've seen this as a sole expression of left isomerism in a, a, a teenager. And overall, uh, the uh, incidence of urogenital anomalies is that much. <clears throat> so what are the features of left isomerism? Dextrocardia, abnormal arrangement, bilateral superior cavus, abnormal hepatic venous drainage, interruption of the IVC as it gets continuation, hepatic venous drainage twice, pulmonary venous uh, connections, partial, AV septal defects with characteristic solitary strand, heart block, mitral atresia, double outlet, and excessive trabeculations. Now, the point about this is I think we have to review this 
in a retrospective fashion. Because when you see dextrocardia or you see mitral atresia with double outlet right ventricle, you have to think back of left isomerism. If you see an interrupted IVC with azygous continuation and um, abnormal abdominal arrangements, think left isomerism. <coughs> so these uh, associated features are the ones that make you think of going back and checking your diagnosis. So they are important, helpful features for making the diagnosis. So let's just run through a couple of these. <coughs> Here's the stomach and the apex of the heart. This is the, what I think is the best radiological definition of heterotaxy. There's misplacement of the abdominal and thoracic organs. Okay. This happens to be an example of left isomerism. And here you can see the descending aorta and the azygous vein have got different colors because the blood is heading in different directions. And the stomach is also here, right-sided. So I'll just uh, drop those out and zoom this up so that you can see this comparison. And this has got a double hit because there's a V and an A, and this has just got one pulse, which is the systemic arterial uh, 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 pulse wave. Now, here in left isomerism, uh, you see bilateral superior cable veins, but the one cable vein is actually draining to a coronary sinus. And it's kind of difficult to recognize. I think once you see bilateral KV, it's enough, but you then have to look carefully to see where the cable vein is draining. And here's the left superior cava and the right superior cava. <clears throat> the left cava is probably big because there's an azygous vein associated with this. <clears throat> <clears throat> I zoomed that up for the phone uh, users. And then here is a morphological example of the azygous vein coming up on the left side and entering the left superior vena cava, <coughs> excuse me, behind the left atrium. <coughs> I've got a little frog in my throat this morning. And here you see the azygous vein going over the right bronchovascular bundle. Uh, excuse me. And here's a beautiful CT scan showing the azygous vein going over the right bronchovascular, the left bronchovascular bundle, and joining with the left sided superior vena cava and entering the atrium. And this is an echocardiographic example in a fetus showing the superior cable vein and the azygous vein the hepatic veins coming into the atrium with an interrupted IVC. And you see here again, the azygous vein in color going over the bronchovascular bundle and entering the superior vena cava on the left side before it drains into the atrium. And here is a postnatal example showing the azygous vein coursing over the bronchovascular bundle and the pulmonary veins and uh, I'll zoom in on that, take the labels off for you and let you see that in real time uh, again. And here's this beautiful azygous vein coming over the bronchovascular bundle. And here's the left palmy veins draining into the left atrium and that there's also only hepatic veins uh, draining here into the atrium. <clears throat> now the azygous veins are easy to see. Here's an example showing the descending aorta and the azygous vein, usually lying on the same side of the spine. And here is an echocardiographic example of this. <clears throat> you see the pulsating aorta, the intercostal vessels coming off the aorta, and behind it, lying in the paravertebral gutter, lies the azygous vein coming up and draining over uh, the bronchovascular bundle into the superior cava on the left side there. <clears throat> and I zoomed that up for you so that you can see it more clearly. Now the hepatic veins. Now the hepatic veins drain into the atrium and the way they drain is interesting because they sometimes drain as a single as I've shown you here. 
Here are three hepatic veins of confluence here. Here are the hepatic veins on the left side. The right hepatic veins in still frame are not easy to see. So we'll take that off. And now you can see, as I take off the veins, that the hepatic veins here all draining together and coming into the atrium together in a little stump of what might be considered the inferior cable orifice. <coughs> I beg your pardon if I've hurt your ears. I've got a little frog in my throat. So uh, let's just uh, hopefully move on. Yes. Now, sometimes the hepatic veins drain in a different way. And here you can see the hepatic veins draining bilaterally into two different atriums. They drain at the corners of what often is a common atrium from the back and from the front. And here you see the hepatic veins on a CT scan. Now, they may drain in a different fashion to two corners of the atrium here. And here you can see uh, the right hepatic veins draining to the right side of this common atrium, the left hepatic veins draining to the left side of this common atrium. And here we'll put this into motion. And here you can see the hepatic veins in color. And there are the hepatic veins draining in there, more, more closely associated with what you see on this side. So vastly different to the corners of the atrium and almost, whoops, I'll just have to let that go, to the central part of the atrium there. So hepatic veins are very useful. And here with that, we're using the same pattern to show bilateral left bronchi, bilaterally draining uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous return to this common atrium. And here are the hepatic veins. And here we can see that the pulmonary veins are draining to two separate sides of the atrium, just as the hepatic veins are doing in this example. So, a quite ecumenistical thing. Here's the color showing this. We missed the color here, but I think you can clearly see that there's a pulmonary vein on this side draining to this side of the atrium. I think there's a little atrial strand here. And then this is the, the right pulmonary veins on this side. And there's a common AV septal defect as well, common AV valve with an AV septal defect. And here we look at the same example here in the fetus. And in the fetus, you can see the hepatic veins with color, courtesy of Dr. Uh, C.R. Patel again, the genius of isomerism in utero. Okay. And here you can see the atrial septum here. So this pulmonary vein is draining to this atrium, and this pulmonary vein group is draining to this atrium. So partial anomalous pulmonary venous return is a feature of left isomerism. And here you can see the veins draining to the back of the different sides of the bilateral right atrium appendages. And we've seen this picture before, and because of the interest of time, I'm going to move on a little bit. And you've seen this picture again, I'll just let it play that shows the, uh, the azygous vein descending aorta, uh, the pulmonary veins draining to this atrium, the strand of tissue here, the appendages, the difference of the rate of the atriums in the ventricles, beat, 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 the AV septal defect and the ventricular communication here. Uh, and also the spongy myocardium, which is present in this art as well. Double outlet right ventricle mitral atresia is a feature of left isomerism. And here is such an example. I'm looking here to show you the aorta arising above this heart. Here is the absence of the left AV valve area here. And the uh, pulmonary artery is arising uh, from the right ventricle. The aorta here is coming off the left ventricle, but there's actually mitral atresia. 
And the echocardiographic example here shows a left ventricle here, obstruction within the outflow tract, and the aorta and pulmonary artery arising above the right ventricle. So double out left right ventricle and mitral atresia. Here's another example showing an AV septal defect. Here's double outlet from the right ventricle. And here are the echocardiographic examples showing the same. So you see the double outlet from the right ventricle with black and white and color imaging. There's the right ventricle. And here, when we look at this in the subcostal sagittal as opposed to coronal cut, we can see the left ventricle here, the right ventricle here, a right dominant AV septal defect, and the pulmonary and aortic trunk arising with the pulmonary trunk anterior, the aorta posteriorly, and the interventricular communication, not inferior vena cava. This is in, uh, in the interventricular communication here between the left and the right side of the heart, and the pulmonary artery going down the descending aorta through a ductus, so a ductal arch. Okay, now the associated lesions in right eye zomerism, uh, well, of course, we said bilateral SVC, the IVC AO juxtaposition, which is very important, it's important not only because of that issue, but it's also important because many of these patients will perhaps undergo a Fontan procedure. And the IVC is usually on the wrong side of the spine. It's on the wrong side, so it crosses over, and it can be a real problem for transplantation. <coughs> Total anomalous pulmonary venous return, and for the Fontan procedure, by the way, uh, pulmonary venous obstru with obstruction either below or above the diaphragm, and occasionally to the azygous vein. Unusual sites of pulmonary venous return, such as azygous vein. AV septal defect with atrial strand, pulmonary stenosis, atresia, transposition, double outlet right ventricle, pulmonary stenosis or atresia. So here's bilateral SVCs here. On the outside, you can't really recognize how different they are. And here is an echocardiographic example taken from the subcostal coronal cut. And there you see uh, the flow coming into the atriums bilaterally, maybe perhaps here and here, two small terminal crests that we didn't focus on with the color for this picture here. But that at least points out also where the terminal crest is, because the terminal crest is right at the junction of where the right atrium is. And we've seen that before. Here's the juxtaposition of the aorta and the IVC on the same side of the spine. A central stomach, a large liver, okay? And uh, here you can see that on an echo. Here the aorta is the back vessel, and here the pulmonary artery is, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, the, uh, the hepatic veins of the front vessel, Here's the spine, and here is the juxtaposition of the IVC. Um, this is IVC, sorry. Uh, here's the hepatic veins. And here is the uh, IVC in front of the aorta on the same side of the spine. So juxtaposition is an important issue. Aorta and IVC on the same side of the spine. This is total anomalous pulmonary venous return, the usual type without a central confluence and what we used to call an inverted Christmas tree. You know, um, uh, so here are all of the veins draining separately without a confluence, but going down into a vertical vein which drains into the porta hepatis. And here is such an example in isomerism. Here you can see the uh, aorta at the back the uh, anomalous vertical vein coming down into the porta hepatis, running across the spine here and entering the hepatic vein here uh, as it drains into the, the heart here. 
And here is another example looking at this in greater detail. You see the portal venous confluence, the right hepatic vein, the ductus venosus or the venous duct entering the uh, hepatic vein and joining with the IVC and entering the heart. And here's an example of obstruction at the junction of the pulmonary venous confluence with the portal vein as shown by Doppler. So I'll let you have one look at this in, in real time here. I'll move my cursor away. And now you can see the aorta and the pulmonary artery if you're looking here, the portal venous confluence here and everything going across here. And this one showing a mag of this with the ductus venosus or venous duct uh, over here and the obstruction at this point over here at the portal confluence. And of course, obstruction can occur anywhere from the diaphragm through the confluence through into the liver, et cetera, et cetera. And then sometimes the veins go up and here's a vertical vein going up a dissection from the back showing the uh, pulmonary veins joining into a vertical vein and scooting over the heart. The esophagus and the descending aorta have been moved away from this so that you can see this. And here is such an example echocardiographically of these venous structures. Here the veins coming together. Here the pulmonary arteries, the bronchus is not seen and there's acceleration of flow across the vertical vein as it crosses between the bronchus and the uh, pulmonary artery, the so-called hemodynamic vice. And here's a better example of obstruction, looking here at the vice between the bronchus behind, the pulmonary artery above, and the vertical vein running between them and being sandwiched here. And here is a beautiful example of an acceleration of flow with the jet as the venous confluence is coming uh, uh, towards the vertical vein with the Doppler signal below. <coughs> There we go. And that's a sample showing the high velocity of flow in a pulmonary vein at uh, about uh, a meter per second, four or five millimeters of mercury obstruction at this point. And there's the right pulmonary artery crossing over here. It may drain into the azygous vein. I right? bring this point because when you see veins draining into an azygous, you've got a 50 50 chance of having right isomerism. So again, once you find an azygous vein draining into a, uh, a superior cave and receiving the pulmonary veins as well, this is not an interrupted inferior vena cava. You can see the inferior vena cava here. This is an azygous vein receiving anomalous pulmonary veins. And the normal connection is now restrictive because of the tremendous pulmonary blood flow coming back into the azygous with the azygous venous connection across the normal size chamber. And so there you see this huge azygous vein in this patient who definitely has an inferior cava. And this is right atrial isomerism. Look at this beautiful right atrial appendage. And there is the terminal crest right there. And this is another example showing bilateral right atrial appendages, a complete AV septal defect, and pulmonary veins draining to the wrong-sided atrium. Normally, the pulmonary veins would be expected to drain here, but this form of anomalous pulmonary venous return directly to the right atrium is a feature of right isomerism as well. And so as this is an uncommon feature, but important. I've shown you this in a fetus, I'm now showing to you in a postnatal example with uh, anomalous venous drainage to the right-sided atrium here. <clears throat> These are quite easy to fix. All you do is you excise the septum here and put in a patch here, and that takes care of that, but you have to fix the AV septal defect as well. And then the solitary strand, here's an example of a solitary strand, bilateral right atrial appendages, 
an AV septal defect with the bridging valve, valves down here. Clearly, the pectinate muscles are shown here. This patient has dextrocardia, has got an, an, ost an ostium secundum, and a common AV valve with a little strand of tissue there. I'll take the frames away so that you can see them. And there's all that remains of the nubbin of the atrial septum. Besides that, there's no atrial septum. And here is this little nubbin that you see here uh, that uh, was dissected by the echocardiogram. Here's another example of ostium primum AS, uh, secundum uh, ASD. And here is the AV septal defect with the two bridging leaflets in the strand. And here again, the ostium secundum, ostium primum, uh, complete AV canal uh, uh, separated by the valve. And these are almost invariably type C of Rostelli, which is another helpful hint. And of course, here's the, the septum down here, a huge interventricular communication in this patient. <clears throat> this shows pulmonary stenosis and atresia. Here is the aorta. Here's where the pulmonary valve is. The pulmonary valve is hard to see. It's a small little sliver there. Here's the right dominant AV septal defect. And here I've used the sagittal plane to show the position of the aorta anteriorly. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the pulmonary artery posteriorly aorta, pulmonary artery, and you can see from the size of the pulmonary artery that it's tiny and that its flow is actually contributed on by means of an arterial duct. There is a valve over here, but it's totally atretic. And the pulmonary trunk is posterior, uh, a usual feature of right isomerism. And here's the black and white image from this uh, frame in a... Um, in, in this view, slightly different view from what you see here. And lastly, the presence of the arterial duct. Here is a patient with uh, the aorta coming from the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery from the left ventricle, and here is the arterial duct. That's the isthmus. Here's the arterial duct over here, and here is the echocardiogram showing the arterial duct in this patient with pulmonary atresia, the sole source pulmonary blood flow is from the arterial duct. And there you can see that very beautifully, the pulsating aorta and the continuous wave, uh, continuous flow ductus arteriosus coming towards you. And there's the Doppler evidence that samples are showing the flow going in the opposite direction and feeding the atretic pulmonary artery. The pulmonary arteries may be separated, and when they are separated and go directly, the central pulmonary artery is missing here. There are bilateral ducts going to the hilum of the lung. Here are the bilateral ducts. Here, of course, is total anomalous pulmonary venous return in right isomerism. And here is an angiogram from one, which I think shows very beautifully the uh, right duct coming from the descending aorta which is right-sided, and the left duct coming from the base of the other aortic arch, the, the brachiocephalic trunk here, feeding into the pulmonary artery, and there's absence of the central area. So I'll let you look at that with the labels on, and now with the labels off, and of course we can stop this anywhere and look at that area where the arteries are separated. And I think you can see here is the duct. The duct is somewhat constricted. There's the left pulmonary artery. This is a neonate, obviously. The aortic arch here, which is right-sided with mirror image branching, okay? And then here is a reconstruction of this um, uh, aorta showing the left duct going to the pulmonary artery, the right aortic arch, with the right duct going to the right pulmonary artery. And the echocardiogram shows the aortic arch to the right with the right duct coming off the base of the arch. And here's the arch to the left duct. 
coming off the base of the anominate vessel. Same patient by the ECG. So we just turn the probe round from one uh, parasagittal to another parasagittal direction and look at the two ducts. So in summary, left isomerism, uh, often bilateral SDC one to a coronary sinus. Coronary sinus is usually present. Coronary veins dying directly. Frequent symmetrical uh, pulmonary venous confluence. Uh, expect interruption of the inferior cava. Hepatic veins usually drain directly and can drain via infradiaphragmatic confluence. In right isomerism, expect bilateral SVCs to the atrial root, always absence of coronary sinus, coronary veins di directly to the atrial chambers, always totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection to systemic veins in about half of the case, direct to the heart in the remainder really directly to the atrial root, more frequently to a midline confluence. And conduction issues, greatly influenced by the presence of isomeric atrial appendages, bilateral sinus nodes in right isomerism, lack of a true sinus node in left isomerism, atrioventricular conduction reflects the ventricular topology, which I mentioned. So that's uh, all. When the syndrome described as heterotaxy often exists, and has considerable clinical significance and should be classified into its right and left isomeric subsets. When judged according to the stents of the pectinate muscles, evidence of isomerism within the atrial chambers is unequivocal, but only available to the morphologist and not to the clinician. Only the appendages are isomeric. Mostly cardiac features are variable as is the bronchial and splenic status, but less frequently and potential ambiguity is removed by description using sequential segmental analysis. And I should say that uh, the appendages uh, can only be seen uh, by the morphologist that now with the good MRI and CT in older patients, but not in the fetus, you can recognize appendage morphology clearly. And certainly with echocardiographic highlights, you can see some of the appendage morphology as well. So. Lastly, uh, the last chapter of my book will soon be available on Epstein's malformation, and I thank you all for your attention. And let me get back into the... Um, yeah, let's stop sharing. Oh, here I am in my study, and... Uh, there's, there's two questions and answers. Let me try and answer them first. Is the as a got okay? This is a, always a question. Now I have my own opinion about this, and my opinion is that um, you should just call it an azagos vein. Azagos means without a twin, so there's no azagos vein on the left side. I call it an azagos vein whether it's right or left sided. Now I may be wrong, but to me it makes no difference, and of course. When you're dealing with situs issues, with issues of uh, left right laterality, I just call it an azygous vein. So I hope that answers my, your question, uh, Jason. And now, uh, Sulafa Ali, in bilateral doctor, how can we make sure that is not an AP collateral? Well, I think that's a very clever point that you uh, raise because you can get bilateral um, um, mapkas of course. But I think uh, the examples that I've shown you here um, are very interesting because we trace the ductuses all the way from their origin of the brachiocephalic and the, uh, and the vessel. And in actual fact, there were not multiple MAPCAs, major aorta pulmonary collateral arteries. There is a similarity between absent bilateral ducts and MAPCAs because we normally say that the ductus drains centrally to either the bulb of the pulmonary arteries or immediately to the branch origins of the pulmonary arteries. But in this condition, the central pulmonary artery is absent. 
so the the ducks do tend to go towards the hilum, just as we showed in that example. So uh, I think that uh, it's it may be a difficult issue to solve completely, but if you can find an aorta with a vessels in the usual position, then uh, it it's may well be more likely to be an arterial duct. And of course, in that situation, as that's the sole source of pulmonary blood flow, giving uh, prostaglandin is, is very important. The other issue about MAPGAS is that uh, usually when you find them, they come in, uh, in, uh, in different uh, dire directions and multiply. So, and they also are usually lower in their uh, origin than the vessels that come from the duct, which are usually higher in the origin. And that's all I can give you uh, in terms of making that uh, differential. Now, Jason's asked cases. Well, Jason, the question is, as far as the anomalous veins are concerned, I don't think that there is um, uh, necessarily a difference. To my mind, the difference comes with the associated lesions. I mean, people have talked about on rack scoring that making uh, right isomerism a six on the rack scale of five. And I think that, um, you know, that this is uh, certainly um, the issue that I would say about the surgical outcomes. The outcomes of uh, right isomerism, even today, are somewhat worse than other conditions. And if you follow the literature, and you read these articles as, as I do, as it's an interest of mine, I find that, you know, uh, when you talk about right isomerism, there's always bad news in terms of prognosis. And of course, you know, when you're dealing with an AV septal defect and all of the other and pulmonary stenosis and things like that, it becomes a real quagmire for uh, prognostic, uh, um, uh, for good prognosis. Okay, all right, so that takes care of the questions. Let's see what the chat frames say, huh? okay? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Saleh, I appreciate that. Now, there's a question from ER, who says, is it possible to two right atriums and two sinus nodes and also two left atrium as well? This means basically the question of the program in the DNA in our body. Yes, I think that's true. It does relate to the DNA in our body. Um, the, the, you don't get two left atriums and two right atriums. You get atrial appendages. The atriums cannot be symmetrical because they come from different tissue and they've got different connections. The probably the um, the the uh, first heart field, these are abnormalities of the first heart field, and the atrial appendages are part of the first heart field uh, in injection. Now, now, you know, I, I, don't know, I want to stay away from um, speculating about the sperm uh, 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 flagellum, but there are, if you look at the, at, at the genetics of sperm flagellum, there are a number of genes that are responsible for spermatic uh, flagella. Okay. Uh, now, um, let's go to the next question. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking to see the questions. So thank you for the compliments, ladies and gentlemen. But I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, 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 to find some questions. Uh, it's obviously a very difficult area, and um, there are no further questions. Um, I just would like to thank Grace and Sasha for the fact that they're in Libya today, uh, doing work and uh, helping us with uh, this presentation. And uh, there was no music today, unfortunately, but uh, they are busy doing other things. And um, I just would remind you all that these presentations are available on um, 
the um, uh, Congenital Heart Academy website, which you have, and um, uh, that's uh, that's certainly something that you can look at because I think this is a complicated issue, um, and uh, I think that uh, it bears uh, repeating. I'm still learning about it too. So I thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, and I wish you all a good day or a good night, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.